All right, let's call to order the Planning Commission meeting today, 6 p.m., 6.02 p.m. specifically. Um, let's see, we're just gonna launch right into it. I, don't, I think we're gonna hang on to the, um, the open public meeting part being afterwards, where we discuss minutes and all that other stuff, and we're just gonna start the public, the public hearing right now. Um, so this is a public hearing on amendments to the Brattleboro land use regulations. It's the culmination of work that's occurred on and off since the current land use uh, and development regulations were adopted in 2016. Some of the recommendations came from the Development and Review Board of Brattleboro, who works with the regs in kind of a judicial uh, role. Um, some came from Brattleboro planning staff and other staff maybe, and some have come from this planning commission and the commissioners themselves um, while reviewing certain sections. Um, so a little bit about the dynamics or the, the logistics of a public hearing. It's conducted not only in public, but for the public. Um, and as such, we'll be inviting public comment. And we're here primarily as commissioners to listen to the public and ask questions of the public. Um, we're here to clarify intent um, for the public or technical aspects of the, of the regs and the amendments, but not to continue like we've done in past meetings, um, debating the merits of any amendments. We've already all agreed, um, or at least a, a quorum, you know, or, or a general consensus has agreed to move forward with them. Um, so once again, this is all for the public and helping them, uh, helping understand their, their, their perspective, but also helping clarify for them. Um, so after we close the hearing tonight, we will consider all of the comments and then make any further changes that we deem necessary. And then we'll forward it to the select board if we you know, make the motion to do so and, and approve it um, with enough votes. And let's see, um, the, even though we're kind of the, the foundation of creating these land use regs and the amendments, the ultimate authority to adopt them for the town rests with the select board. So after it passes, out of, this, of the planning commission's uh, sort of purview, then it will go to the select board and they will hold two public hearings. Um, and those will most likely be in June of this year, next month. So um, this public hearing was warned in accordance with state law. And I'd like to introduce the Brattleboro planning director, Sue Fillion, to review how this meeting was warned. Thanks, Tom. Um, state statute requires that the first um, set of uh, warnings are done 15 days prior to the hearing. Um, we sent a copy of the proposed bylaw amendments, um, the hearing notice, and a report about what the amendments are and how they relate to, um, you know, how they change districts or, you know, there's like five questions that we need to respond to. Um, we sent those to uh, the planning commission chairs of the adjacent municipalities. So that's Vernon, Marlboro, Dummerston, Guilford, Halifax. We also put a copy on um, filed with the town clerk um, and the public was directed that it's available there. I understand the municipal center is not open, but if anybody reached out, they would have been able to get a copy of them. Um, and then we also posted them to the town website and we put the hearing warning in the Brattleboro Reformer, which ran on um, April 24th. Um, so that was in advance of the 15 days or, or that, that met the 15 day standard. Um, we also sent a digital copy to the Wyndham Regional Commission as required by statute and also the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, I do want to let you know that the copies that we sent digitally um, had, a, had an error in them. Um, anything that was copied had strikeout, so underlined and track change. You know, we did track changes, so there was a strike through on anything that was gonna be deleted and there was a underline on anything that was um, new language. Um, and for the neighboring towns and the town clerk's office, they received the appropriate copies because uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Wyndham Regional Commission and what was originally posted to the website um, was a PDF of it. Um, we didn't learn until 
uh, last week um, when Tom noticed that the strikeout changes for some of the amendments were not there. Um, the, the language, the new language was there, but you couldn't really see um, what the change was, what was being deleted and what was new language. Um, I did not realize that when you convert a PDF that it, it doesn't track those changes. It just gives you the, the language that's meant to be. So the underlying language is included, but the strikeout goes away. Um, and so that was a defect. Um, I did reach out to the town attorney um, to talk about that. And um, there are some provisions in state statute that cover these kind of errors. Um, so he did not feel that it was a fatal defect and that it could move forward tonight. Uh, right. Yeah, and we did, or, or you did update all of the, um, the materials a couple or a few days ago, right? So people yes. have, even though it, maybe not 15 days specifically, there's there has been some time to review. Was that in Google Docs that you sent uh, Tom or Sue to us recently? Which um, I love the, Google Docs. <laughs> the Planning Commission received Google Docs and you all received correct versions. Okay. It was when I created a PDF to put it on the town website oh. that um, it kind of converted um, the language um, so you couldn't see the tra the track changes anymore. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So a little hiccup, but I think in general we've still met all of the requirements, and um, for this sort of public hearing and meeting. Um, but I'm not an attorney. Our attorney reviewed it and felt like it was it was okay despite the hiccups. So on we proceed. Um, but I think we'll pass it back to Sue now to actually discuss the um, a summary of, of all the amendments. Just give me a second here. And then right after that, we'll be, um, we'll just open it up to the public to hear comments or questions or ideas about these amendments. But Sue's going to give a summary now. So I'm going to try to summarize. Um, I did do, a, I have about 17 slides here. Some will move quicker than others. Um, and in not every, for, um, I didn't put the language up for each and every, every amendment. I tried to summarize it, but there is some language that you'll see on the screen. So I'll walk through it. Um, so. Uh, Tom um, went over this, um, but why are we making some amendments? So um, essentially it's the planning commission's role to write the zoning regulations and it's the select board roles, um, role to adopt it. Um, actually, it's the, the planning commission makes the recommendations of the zoning regulations to the select board. So um, we had a wholesale um, uh, new regulations that came into effect in 2015. Um, and since that time, there's little tweaks that need to be made. And so the planning commission was kind of working on these tweaks along the way, had other projects come up and got back to it. Um, the changes are coming about the amendments that we're proposing. There's, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, some of them are due to changes in the state and federal law. Some of them are a result of conversations with the DRB about what tools they felt that they didn't have in the land use regulations that would help um, with their jobs. Um, some of it was from the planning commission's review for minor amendments um, and discussions, in particular discussions about housing. Um, some are suggestions from planning services um, staff. So either myself or Brian Bannon, the zoning administrator who work with the regulations. Um, one of the major ones that we'll see tonight is a way is a result of um, trying to stay into compliance with the community rating system with um, class eight requirements and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then um, we're also looking to make the interim zoning bylaws um, pertaining to housing permanent. So these were interim regulations that the Planning Commission put forth in August that the select board quickly adopted in September. And um, we feel that there are changes that should be um, permanent. So um, interim bylaws are only good for two years. So while we brought these up, we thought it was a good time to make them permanent. 
Um, so these first two amendments that you're seeing on the screen, these are examples of why just minor word changes that we're doing to come into compliance with state law. So the first one they changed accepted to required agricultural practices. Um, the second one um, is a little bit, uh, it's not just a wording change, um, but it's also um, compliance with state law. So it used to be that if you had a group home, um, you could uh, treat it differently if there was another one located within a thousand feet of another one. Um, now you can't, so um, we're just bringing that into compliance. So we are proposing some changes to our flood regulations, um, and these are the ones that are for compliance with the community rating system. So Brattleboro participates in the National Flood Insurance Program, and so we have to have minimum standards um, to comply. And by participating in the National Flood Insurance Program, people in Brattleboro um, have the ability to purchase flood insurance. The community rating system is a program kind of associated with the National Flood Insurance Program. And if communities take certain actions, um, you get a ranking. And uh, this allows people who have flood insurance policies to get a greater discount. So currently, Brattleboro is a class eight community. Um, this allows residents um, and property owners to, to have a 10% discount. Um, on their flood policies. Um, the CRS community rating system came out with some changes um, that are needed in order to maintain a class eight rating. Um, and they just came out earlier this year. Um, there's basically two main aspects. So the first is that all residential buildings are now going to be, need to be elevated two feet above base flood elevation. Um, our current regulations and the national flood insurance, the NFIP program requirements only require one foot of a base flood elevation. So this change would be two feet of base flood elevation. Um, it also requires that machinery or equipment be elevated to at least one foot above base flood elevation for um, new buildings or buildings that are substantially improved or reconstructed due to substantial damage. Um, Going back to the first one, um, there's a, another, when it says all residential buildings, right now uh, the NFIP allows for mobile homes that are located in mobile home parks that were built before the flood insurance rating maps were out to have a, there's kind of a, an alternate pathway. So they either need to be elevated one foot above base flood elevation or they can be situated on reinforced um, piers, or Brian, correct me if I'm wrong there, um, as long as they're four feet above ground level. Um, so I'm gonna walk through the implications of that for Brattleboro if um, they the, making this change, but, but the CRS class eight requirement means that you have to treat all housing the same, whether it's multifamily, single family, mobile homes in a pre-firm um, park, uh, manufactured homes. I mean, you name it, all residents have to be two feet above base flood elevation. So the benefits um, of, this, of this two foot elevation um, is that it helps pr uh, protect existing development. Um, it responds to climate change because the one foot above the base flood elevation is, um, it's an older standard and it doesn't necessarily take into account increased um, flooding. And you know, the, the standards are based on the 1% uh, chance of, of a storm a year. And we know that we have, um, you know, sometimes it's, a, it's, it's greater than that, um, the flood depths and, and whatnot. Um, it helps to reduce the flood risk to property owners. Um, it will lower insurance premiums. So um, there is some data from FEMA and it's always hard to kind of um, source it. But um, what we've been able to find is that the higher up you are over the base flood elevation, um, the greater the discount. So 
Um, Brian can speak to this a little bit as well. I know he's on this meeting. Um, Brian's the zoning administrator and the floodplain coordinator. Um, that it, it seems that it's a 50%, um, sorry, let me find my notes here. Um, I'm not going to explain this right, and I can't get into my notes right now without everybody seeing it. But um, Brian, if you're, can you turn on your microphone and maybe jump in here to help me out? Nothing wrong with a moment of silence. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. No, no nothing at all. So if it, basically there's a greater discount, the higher up you are. So, you know, if your standard flood, flood insurance policy, I think it's about a 50% difference between one foot above base flood elevation. And, um, and if you're two feet, there's, you know, it's gonna cost you less in your premium. Um, so Sue, quick question. Is this all part of FEMA regulations too, correct? With insurance um, wise? Tom, do they... we wanna take, questions now or how do you want to we want to just wait i'll hold yeah. on to that to it. <laughs> yeah well let's yeah so i don't know wait. it doesn't matter to me but yeah okay. i think, I think we i'm have fine a answering of... that so so um the national flood insurance program is part is a fema program so the one foot above base flood elevation is the minimum requirement for the national flood insurance program the two feet above base flood elevation, which is what the planning commission is proposing, is not a requirement. Oh, okay. um, it is a requirement to maintain that 10% discount um, on flood insurance policies. If we want to try and maintain the CRS rating of eight, which gives a 10% discount, then we, um, we need to do the two feet above, above base flood elevation. Um, and so, yeah, the other benefit is that um, basically the, the amount that the reduction in flood insurance premium can offset the cost of structural elevation. So um, I think I've got an example of that coming up. Um, the drawbacks of it is that it, it um, does require the removal of the existing exception for pre-firm mobile home parts. Um, so they will no longer in mountain home um, be able to build the homes 48 or four feet above grade. Um, so that is a big change within the park. Um, it can increase the construction costs. Again, those could be offset, but it does increase construction costs. And um, so what I was just talking about is that freeboard or this additional one foot is what's called freeboard is not mandatory in the National Flood Insurance Standard. <laughs> um, and so here is um, just an example of fr the freeboard, which is again, the one foot um, over. So it'd be the two feet above base, base flood elevation. So uh, this was a FEMA publication um, that a county government in North Carolina had on their webpage. And, FEMA doesn't date their things and it's hard to find out what year it came out from. And um, really when I was looking around, couldn't really find anything after 2016 either. Um, but the, this example is, is showing that the upfront costs of elevating it um, higher is um, only about a quarter to 1.5% of the total construction costs for each foot of freeboard. Um, but the long-term savings on the flood insurance will offset the cost. So in this example, if you add two feet of freeboard to a new home, you might add $20 a month to the mortgage payment. Um, but the flood insurance savings could be more than $1,000 a year um, for a building that's in a river flooding zone, zone AE, which is what we have in Brattleboro. Um, we... The Planning Commission had asked back in March um, if we could survey um, our policyholders in Brattleboro. And so we looked into doing that. 
Um, but the costs of mail doing a mailing survey um, were quite high. It was going to be around seven hundred dollars. So we made the decision to um, try to pursue the information in other ways. Um, back in March, we requested of the community rating system uh, more recent policy data. Um, they said it would take about six weeks. We followed up with them at the end of April and there's some sort of transition between systems. So they were trying to get us the information by tonight, but they didn't get it to us. So um, I don't know when that's gonna be in. In 2016, there were 111 policies, flood insurance policies in Brattleboro. Um, the average building coverage was $193,500. $193,509. In 2017, there were 101 policies um, with an average building coverage of 203,000, 200, $203,580, sorry. Um, so those are our policies. One of the differences in 2017, around that time, they started moving to actuarial rates. So flood insurance policies are getting more expensive um, I think that Brian found that the somewhere in Vermont, the average is around um, 16, 1650 um, is the average flood insurance policy. But again, those policies are dependent on, um, you know, the elevation. And we know we have a lot of um, buildings and a lot of utilities that are not even elevated one foot above base flood elevation. So it's, it's likely that our policies are um, are more expensive than that, but we don't have that documentation for you. Um, the other thing is, is if you think, if you kind of figure out the savings, it looks like um, if you apply, apply the 10% um, savings that you get from being in CRS 8 across the board, it looks like it's saving um, about $22,000. I mean, again, that would be stretched out over the 101 policies or 111 policies, but um, it does provide savings for people, um, but it's, you know, around 22,000 kind of town-wide. This is a map of um, Mountain Home Park. Um, so what you see is um, this pink is floodway. And um, the rules in the floodway say that you cannot build any new, um, you can't build any new, new construction, new residential, new residences in the floodway. So these are all existing mobile homes um, in the floodway. Uh, they are subject to the tri-park agreement. So um, if these homes become substantially damaged, they are going to need to be removed and will not be replaced. Um, the light blue that you're seeing is the special flood hazard area. It's the area outside where we do allow um, residential construction right now in mobile home, in uh, mountain home. We allow either the four foot above grade or the one foot above base flood elevation. Um, what I've circled in yellow are homes that are subject to the um, agreement between the town and TriPark to uh, try to relocate those um, homes from these high risk areas. But <clears throat> as you will see, there's several more homes um, that are in the special flood hazard area where they would be subject to um, the new standard if it was adopted of the two foot above base flood elevation. And this map shows the, um, the base flood elevation. So the reds are basically properties that are located um, or that are, the base flood elevation is 8.1 to 9.3 feet higher than the ground level. So when you start adding two feet on, you can see that these um, homes located in these areas, if there was to be new construction, um, or if they wanted to substantially, if they substantially improved their homes, they're going to have to be elevated a lot more than four feet. Um, we're talking, you know, up to 12 feet high. Um, so that is something to consider. Uh, the yellow is um, 
you'd be in a range of elevation of about five to six feet um, for some of these homes that are coated yellow. Another thing to take into account is there are these homes um, on the left side of the street, um, the reds and the oranges. They are not in the mapped floodway or floodplain, sorry, but um, we do have elevation data that tells us that they are actually subject to the floodplain elevation. Um, there's been some, some work done. So you can see that this affects a lot of homes. Um, if we make this change, it affects a lot of homes in Mountain Home Park. Um, and then something else to balance is um, the viability of the park. And so if, if homes can't be built here, um, you know, if an older home is replaced with a new one, um, you're, you're balancing the, um, the health of the park, I guess. Um, but then there's also the, the flood risk um, and the safety measures to take into account. Sue? Yep. Oh, my mic is actually working great. <laughs> so that exception only works if you're replacing it, not because of a flood. So if the park were to get hit by a large flood again, under our current regulations, any home that was substantially damaged would have to meet the standard for regular residences. So potentially they would get hit by bringing everything damaged up to that higher standard instead of having that higher standard applied gradually as homes are naturally replaced. Yes, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that, Brian. Um, this is Glen Park. This is a, another tri-park property that is, um, again, the pink is the floodway. Um, there are no homes in the floodway in Glen Park. Um, there is, there are homes in light blue, which is the special flood hazard um, area, the remainder of the special flood hazard area. Um, the base flood depths are not as deep here, but you can see there are several homes um, impacted here as well. So this is a range of um, the, let's see, the, the light green is, um, 1.3 to two, so you're looking at, at an elevation of 3.3 you know, to four feet um, um, for the, if what would need to be elevated to a high of the, the light oranges are 3.3 um, to 4.1. So again, that's the five to six foot elevation that would need to be done here in Glen Street. Again, if they were replaced if they were substantially improved or if they were reconstructed after substantial damage. Um, so before I move on there, I guess, Tom, do you want me to take any questions on that? Uh, um, well, the way we had things laid out was that actually, you know, I, I said that we were gonna launch right into public mm -hmm. comment after your, your presentation, but I forgot we, you know, we were gonna discuss some of kind of the the format or, or rules for lack of a better word about the public hearing. So I don't know, I think it would, it would be good for the public's memory if we take questions after each amendment, but also, I don't know, I don't know Sue how strictly, you know, we should follow that, that protocol. Yeah, I think um, if, I think that we, we don't need to follow it that strictly if um, that was a lot of information. So if, if there's questions now right. um, from the public, I think that, Okay. If you um, want to take it, I'm fine with that. I think so. Yeah, I'll just say quickly, you know, looking at these notes here that um, we were going to say, if you wish to speak, please use the raise hand feature um, and we'll call on you and unmute yourself. Um, and uh, also please identify yourself with first and last name. And I guess um, we're seeking address as well to maybe show that you're a Brattleboro resident. And um, yeah, let's just stick with that. Pretty, pretty easy rules. <laughs> so, but we only have two public here, so maybe we can just wave that that wave hand feature too, and just just actually wave your physical hand or the the, the you know the blue one in the participant window, however you want. Um, yeah, so I see Kay Curtis up. Do you want to unmute yourself and introduce yourself and address? Yeah, my name is Kay Curtis. I live in Mountain Home Park in Tri Park. Uh, at 151 Mountain Home Park, uh, Winding Hill. 
Um, my, my mailing address is 151. My physical address is 5 Winding Hill. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I wondered if anyone has looked into whether you can, uh, whether people can actually get in and out of homes in a senior park with the elevation so high. Has anyone looked into whether that's even possible for people to live in homes that high off the ground? There won't be any elevators. <laughs> uh, can you make ramps that work when, when places are that close together? I'm just really concerned that this doesn't work for the, in order to save 10% on everybody's insurance. But if it doesn't work for this many people, we are talking about a lot of people here. Um, I think you're talking about about a third of our people and we have a thousand people. So um, I'm just wondering, has anyone looked into the feasibility about whether this actually works for people, not just for, um, for saving money on insurance? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I try an answer on that, Tom? Sure, yeah, please, Brian. Sure, so I think that's a really valid point. Access does become pretty problematic when you get to some of these higher elevations, it's really going to be a two-story home in effect. In Glen Park, um, one home was destroyed in Hurricane Irene and, and then subsequently replaced because it was outside of the floodway. It had deeper flood depths. I can't recall whether it was 107 or 105 or 109. It was owned by Sylvia Renfrew and had to meet the one foot elevation above base flood elevation. So it was higher than had previously been allowed. And it was possible to actually meet that regulation and, and not have to, even though it wasn't subject to that exception any longer and have an effective ramp. It was a pretty elaborate ramp. It's really a large one. Um, I think the Rotary Club like, actually stepped in and helped her build it. Um, but, Yes, in Glen Park, I think it would be feasible. With the depths they have in Mountain Home Park, I do not think it would be feasible. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, the next hand up is one of our commissioners, Doran. Um, yeah, I just want to also uh, bring into just as, as we are constantly looking at in the Planning Commission on how to make sure that to bring to allow more housing in Brattleboro and make sure that uh, that we are uh, preserving housing at the same time as um, uh, as you know trying to deal with work with climate change, but also at the same time uh, with the insane rise of housing costs um, and most of the burden will be on that of really low income uh, folks like the, the cost of building right now is like 200% for like base for like very simple wood costs um it's so expensive to build right now and especially if it's in the if it's really placed on lower income uh people so i just i just especially this is a, a more even especially new to covid so i just wanted to bring that up yep um i saw william william's hand up earlier but it seems switched to a yes icon but if if you want to speak william feel free uh, yes, I, I did want to make a few comments. Thank you. Um, and, and remember the name and address. Yeah, so my name is William Hodgson. Uh, I'm actually not a Brad Verizon. I am Tri Parks manager. So I'm uh, representing an awful lot of Brattleboro residents. Um, and part of my uh, official job is to, to handle Tri Parks permitting and um, stuff like that. So um, <clears throat> Sue uh, did a good job explaining, you know, uh, some of the impacts that we would be faced with. Um, I'm not sure if anybody did a quick count of the number of housing sites we're talking about, uh, but it's it's upwards of, of you know 70 housing sites um, that would be affected by uh, a change in in the uh, el elimination of the four foot exemption. Um, just a quick example of costs. Uh, we recently used one of these sites that's that's currently vacant and worked with uh, Stevens and Associates to develop a, an acceptable foundation design 
for these flood hazard areas in the hopes of redevelopment, uh, redeveloping some of these empty sites. And um, we spent five or $6,000 working with them to come up with this design. And we went through development review in uh, March and our design was approved. Uh, that slab design with, with three foot reinforced piers, uh, we're looking at about an $18,000 design. That's just a three foot pier. So if we start talking about going up six, eight, 10, 12 feet, there are no peer systems that are going to be acceptable in that situation. We're, we're talking about, you know, like Brian said, uh, a, a two story dwelling essentially. So you're talking, you know, a concrete foundation with, with full, you know, eight foot or, or higher concrete walls. I mean, now we're talking probably $30,000 worth of, of just foundation work or more. Um, you know, a, a house having to be set with a crane, there's another three to $5,000. It's, um, I just think there's, there's a lot of costs here that isn't, I, I don't know if it's really on anybody's mind. Um, it's definitely on my mind. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working on trying to preserve housing sites in our, our three parks. And um, I think this is a, a huge, huge, huge uh, problem that, that, you know, we would face um, moving forward if, if you were to adopt these changes. Um, and again, I, I think the, the FEMA standard and the NFIP standard is, is workable. You know, we're, we're trying to work with it. We, you know, that's, that's why we came up with this, this design to use. Um, but I think a 10% insurance premium is definitely not going to be offset, you know, or, or offset any, any additional construction costs. I mean, uh, a $30,000 foundation that somebody has to pay for, you know, for a $750 a year insurance premium. So they're saving, you know, 75 bucks a year with that 10%. That's like 400 years before they get a return on that. You know, it's, it's just, there's a lot of cost that I don't think is really, really being discussed. Um, and what's going to happen to the park over time if this is adopted is every one of those housing sites when they need to be substantially improved or you know many of these homes were not damaged during irene which was i believe a hundred year you know flood event um even though the boundaries you know say that that they're in that area um many of these homes that we're talking about 50 sites or so never saw water or damage during irene and I'm sure Brian, you know, can, can correct me if I'm way off on that, but um, so we're talking a lot of housing sites that I think it's debatable what, you know, what level of risk they're currently at. And, and if this is really, you know, if the benefits in this situation for us, I don't see them, them outweighing the, um, the drawbacks. So that's, that's my two cents. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so just to remind all the commissioners, and then I think I'll let Brian speak because he was uh, kind of addressed by William. Um, I think, I don't know how much it is statute or general policy about public hearings in Vermont, but you know, the guidelines that we have is that, um, you know, we want to try to focus on asking, you know, clarifying questions and, and additional, getting additional um, input from the, from the public. Um, so maybe as much as we want to say, uh, our perspective on the issues. Um, it's not really the time for that. Um, but yeah, I have some questions for William, but I'll let Brian go first. Um, yeah, so as to the increased cost of construction versus affordability, it's really a question of whether you're talking about a new home that's gonna be financed and is gonna be required to have insurance. Um, the cost of insurance doesn't have that exception for um, being built four feet off the ground. It's gonna be rated like any other house. And if it's you know seven feet below base flood elevation, it's gonna have the maximum insurance premiums. So if you're putting a older home there and you're gonna pay in cash and not need to have any insurance, then that can be viable. But if you're financing, then you could have insurance premiums that are several thousand dollars a year and redeveloping those sites in that way just isn't gonna work. With conventional construction, the cost of piers adding another foot is 
considerably less than um, the insurance savings are considerably more than the cost of increasing the height of construction, um, at least according to FEMA documents. For the pier system, you, you have to switch out to a different type of pier system for the taller heights, but they, they do exist. And they have some really simple ones where basically the homes are elevated on telephone poles and those can go to just ridiculous heights um, and do in places like Louisiana. So nothing that extreme would be needed here, but it, it is actually viable and probably fairly affordable. Uh, in, or in any case, like the foundation that's currently approved, it's expensive, but not, not prohibitively so. Yep. Um, I'll go to Gary. You haven't spoken yet. Well, actually, I did. This is this. I should have held the other question for. Oh, for, sorry. Yep. <laughs> for this particular. Go ahead. And um, I, 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 but hopefully this is applicable. I guess this is a question for you, Tom and Brian and Sue. Uh, it's a two-part question. One, I don't know if you guys had did an on-site look at this. I mean, looking at the the graphs and all that, just to see how it looks. I don't know if that's something we can do. Has already been done, or is it applicable? And second, I don't know if anyone called in also for public participation. I don't know if that's another thing that's we looked into as well too. Has anyone called in or? Right. Or, yeah, Sue. Have we received any um, you know, any submitted materials or any? calls right no i did not receive any submitted materials um as of friday that was the last time i was in the office so no emails no mail yeah, yeah and as far as visiting in person um i can't say that i visited in person since considering these the you know this amendment um but yeah, it's very much a product of, of the, of, you know, the maps and the, you know, so I'm not sure how much visiting in person would, would, mm. would change one's opinion or, or inform it because it's very much based just on things that are, you know, data that's already mapped, I think. I see. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Um, let's see. So this is, um, bringing the rules with the mobile homes into alignment with, uh, with conventional homes, right? It would. Um, I would say um, the conventional, conventional homes in town um, currently are one foot above base flood elevation. So um, they would also go to two, two feet above the base flood elevation if, we, oh, right. if this change went forward. Oh, because it's one feet. So it's, yeah. I think I knew this, I, but I've forgotten. But it's it's one feet. It's one foot state uh, townwide currently, for everything. Yes, with except the mobile home exemption. With the with the option for mobile homes in right. Glen and uh, Mountain Home to be four feet above uh, grade. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess does do any commissioners have questions for the public or? Um, or does the public have more comments on this amendment? Um, perhaps proposals that they would like to see as an alternative or more? Or like questions or confusion about why this may be necessary or, or so much so beneficial. I think those are largely answered, but I think I think we're just you know might be moving on. So, but I see Jessica's hand up, and a few others. Great, <laughs> go ahead, Jessica. Um, yeah, I'm curious. Um, in does this impact only the tri park homes, or does it impact other properties around town? You just mentioned there are other homes that might change get, get impacted if. Um, the two foot choice was just so you, this is like you're you're offering two choices here right the either this or that is that true um well the choices for this one would be we keep it as it is where it's the 
across the board one foot base flood elevation with the option in Glen and Mountain Home to be four foot above grade. Okay. Or we move it all to the two foot above base flood elevation. Um, so to your question, um, there are no other mobile home parks that it affects, but there are lots of residences that it does affect. Um, and probably areas around Meadowbrook Road, they have some deeper flood um, flood depths. Uh, so, you know, two, two foot above base flood elevation. I don't know what they are, but I just know that's an area where it's a bit deeper. It's um, mm -hmm. so, you know, whereas on uh, Frost Street, it might not be as deep, um, but those homes would still be impacted as well. Um, but I would say that most of those, I, I don't know how much, um, maybe Brian can speak to this if his mic is working. Um, again, they're all pre-existing. Most of them, I don't think that there's building lots there, so there's not much new construction. But of course, if they were substantially improved or substantially damaged, they would need to come into compliance. So, um, And I can see if I can get you the number of properties um, real quick. Just to jump in, Sue, I, I think for most areas of town, this would really only kick in if there were new construction. And as you say, there really aren't very many developable lots in the flood hazard areas or homes that are destroyed in future floods or heavily damaged in future floods. Um, at that point, you know, having a higher standard is, can actually be beneficial because it means FEMA funds will actually go towards meeting that higher standard and defray the cost of doing it. Um, so it does increase resilience that way and helps bring in, you know, increased cost of compliance funds for any future disaster. So that means there would be FEMA funds if some of the homes in Glen Park were destroyed in a flood. And they had flood insurance. Some of the the FEMA funds could be used to elevate elevate a property above where it needs to be, and maybe install one of those fifty or sixty foot accessibility ramps that would be needed to get a wheelchair up to that height, um, or to do a buyout. <clears throat> but, buyout. but yes, uh, hazard mitigation funds meet the regulations of a town. So if you have a higher regulatory standard, they'll increase the size of the grants to meet that. Okay, um, it looks like William wants to speak again. I see his hand. Uh, yeah, just uh, a, a, clar a clarification um, with regards to I see this uh, when when something is uh, needs to be substantially improved. Um, you know, if if the this exemption goes away and the new two foot um, requirement is in in effect, and the problem that the the park would be faced with is the um, the value the assessed value of these properties is significantly less than uh, you know stick built dwellings around around town. Um, so the, so the threshold for substantial improvement or you know, substantial damage is, is much lower. Um, so somebody that's just trying to make somewhat regular upgrades to their home may be forced to bring that home into compliance now. Um, that's, that's not gonna be feasible for the majority of our residents. We are low to moderate income households. Um, it's not going to be feasible. So um, is, is, uh, I just wanna clarify that that would be what a lot of these households may be faced with. Um, and that's probably a Brian question. Um, and, and, and any suggestions you would have on, on addressing that, um, you know, to avoid uh, an attrition situation in the, the mobile home parks. Uh, Tom, should I respond to that? Sure, yeah, go ahead. If you Sure. I, you know, I think what Bill says is exactly correct. Um, and we're, we're kind of in a deadlock with a lot of these home sites in Tri Park and in Mountain Home Park in particular, because people already can't afford to substantially improve their homes because, as, as Bill was explaining, a complying foundation could cost 
you know, in the fifteen to twenty thousand dollar range already, which is more than some of these modest income folks can actually afford. So what they are doing is they're allowing, um, they're minimizing their repairs or improvements to their homes, and the value continues to spiral downwards, which makes the threshold for substantial damage decline as well. So it's even as it is, it's a bit of a trap and it's hard to say how to get out of this trap, but allowing for higher risk construction doesn't necessarily solve the situation either. Kay, I see your hand up. I just wanted to make the comment that that a, a FEMA buyout is is at the point that we lose enough of our rentable lots, we're risking the low income housing of a thousand people. So each as a cooperative, each time we lose rentable lots, we risk the viability of people who aren't even in the floodway or the floodplain. So it's one unit and we're all dependent on each other in order to make the whole piece work. So it can't be thought of as individual um, individual property owners or in, because that's not what we are. We are a cooperative that, that uh, exists on the rents of 300 and some some units and each time one is bought out or are not used anymore that that risks the others unless we've relocated them somewhere else which is part of what the master plan implementation is out to do but this this may quicken quicken the attrition rate in the park as bills as bill is saying as william is saying mm -hmm. that's all uh, Doran, do you like to speak? Um, yeah, I just, uh, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, look, just looking at the basic statistics of this on paper and then really hearing it out loud, it just doesn't, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, the, the ability of keeping the exemption for, yeah, for this park seems like, uh, I don't know yet, it, it really listening to it, uh, it seems like how could, how could we remove that exemption? That would just be, if it's threatening the lively or the, the housing of a thousand people in a town with really tough housing. That's, I, yeah, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around that. Um, and I guess just, yeah, thank you very much for the clarification. Um, yeah. yep. I think we're going to um, spend um, time as commissioners after we close the public comment, after we go through the amendments and close the public comment, we'll be having a period of time where we, you know, discuss what we've heard and, and and weigh it and then and we can make um major changes um if we so choose um there's wording that says when it goes to the select board after the public hearings they can only make minor changes and i don't think that's defined but what minor is versus major but but we can make um seemingly kind of whatever changes we want that are on topic um before we send it to the select boards so you know that the time for that will be like at 715 or 720 in our meeting um i think i think um well i see william's hand up again so yeah let's take some more some more comment and thoughts about the flood amendment the proposed flood amendment but I, his hands away yeah i'm all set oh, gary. <laughs> okay sure gary do you have some some thoughts well, no, I'll, just wait, I'll just wait for the commissioner's comments i'm just trying to okay. get the hand down <laughs> there okay. we go all right, great. I think that's um, the last chance for the public going once, going twice, going three times. All right, moving on to the next proposed amendment. Okay. Sue, can you can you continue yes. the presentation? Thank you. So um, the next amendment that I wanted to talk about was um, permanently adopting the interim amendment that we had proposed last summer and the select board adopted. So this was to allow a higher density of housing um, in areas of town that have water and sewer and the capability to handle more housing. Um, 
the we're trying to um, also allow for creative reuse of existing residential structures. So sometimes you have a large old single family home that maybe has a couple of units that are in it. And then there's a garage um, that has the potential for an additional unit there. Um, what we found was the previous zoning regulations were um, had a lot of different different regulations at play um, and that having a density standard that was measured by the number of units you could have uh, per acre was really limiting uh, the number of units that could be created. And in particular, when we know that household size is declining, um, it was leaving larger units and we were seeing some property owners that wanted to make you know one bedroom or two bedroom apartments as, as opposed to having a couple of three bedroom units. Um, so uh, what we did in the interim zoning bylaw was to remove the dwelling unit for acre density standards for residential. Um, and that was in the following zoning districts um, and that you can see on the map. Um, there's the yellow, which is the residential neighborhoods, um, the brown, which is the rural business, the pink, which is the village center, uh, the darker pink, which is the service center, um, the orange neighborhood center, um, and the lighter orange, which is the mixed use, and um, the IT, which is the um, institutional zoning district. Um, that's where a lot of our campuses are located. Um, so those were removed there. Um, we didn't have to do it in the urban center because we already don't have a uh, density standard in the urban center zoning district. And then the other thing that we did was we made uh, three, four, and five unit um, properties permitted uses in the residential, which is that yellow color, the residential neighborhood. Um, previously, it had been conditional use. Um, and you know, there's lots of three, four, five. Um, it's, it's pretty typical in a lot of those neighborhoods. So um, we just moved to make that a permitted use. So um, that's a little overview of what we hope to make um, more permanent. Yep. Yeah, and I think let's just keep going through these unless people raise their blue hands and have a question about them. Because we're, okay. you know, this is an important meeting. It's a public hearing, but we're a little bit behind with the agenda. But but if anyone has, has questions throughout the, the public, please put your hand up as we go through. Okay. Um, so another change that we're proposing to the um, zoning districts, but also an error that Brian caught today. So thank you very much. Um, I, the neighborhood center zoning district, the proposal here was to get rid of the discussion of the Canal Street area. Um, he caught that I made that correction in the wrong um, zoning district that should be in the service center. So perhaps that is something. I would recommend when we get to the planning commission discuss it, discussion that you reject the neighborhood center changes and that instead we apply them to the service center. Um, if we go back to the map, you'll see that the service center, the SC is just in the Putney Road area. Um, there had been discussions when the planning commission put the 2015 zoning amendments or zoning bylaw up of having a service center down on Canal Street, but we didn't move forward with that and we never caught uh, that this was done incorrectly. Um, and then some other minor amendments in the zoning districts. We want to increase the building footprint in the mixed use zoning district to 6,000 square foot. It's currently 4,000 square feet. And uh, we're proposing to remove surface parking and parking garages as permitted uses in the service center zoning district. And um, the way it appears in the amendment means that not only would it not be a permitted use, it would not be a conditional use. So they would not be allowed in this zoning district. So um, just want to make that clear. Um, the sign changes that we're proposing, there, there's a couple of different ones. Um, we want to, in the mixed use zoning district, we allow larger size signs that are really geared toward the traveling public. But when you read the purpose of the mixed use zoning district, it's um, more intended to be walkable neighborhoods. So we want to move the zoning district, uh, the, the sign zone that it's in from three to one. 
Um, this is comparable to the village center, the urban center. Um, so again, based on people walking and you don't need to have really large oversized signs. Um, still obviously visible, but just not too large. Um, another change is to permit vertical blade signs. So if you are familiar with Insight um, Photography, which is down the end of an alley off of Main Street, they have a sign that is um, vertical in nature as opposed to horizontal. And so we didn't have um, adequate regulations that allowed for vertical signs before. Um, and another clarification is allowing, uh, because we do have some businesses that sit down alleys, we are allowing portable signs to um, come out a little bit further if they need to. It doesn't have to be right next to their um, uh, property. So it does still need to be, again, Insight's probably a good example because they're in the back of a building. Um, as long as that property has um, a place that they could put it up close, closer to the street, um, that could come up. And um, as always with portable signs, it does need to be on private property and it cannot restrict um, accessibility of the sidewalk. So that doesn't change with this proposal. Um, we've also made some changes that you see in this language here to respond to federal um, court case. So with temporary signs, um, you can't, um, you, you wanna treat them all the same. They need to be content neutral. So you'll see in the strikeout of four, five, and six, we were specifying certain types of signs. You know, if it was a real estate sign advertising something for sale, if it was a garage sale sign, if it's a special event sign for certain organizations, you know, there would be all these different square footage requirements. So now they just all fall under temporary signs. Um, and um, so that, that's what we're proposing there. And then um, this other category of distinctive signs, this was something that the DRB was really asking for. Um, and so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, wanting to have interesting kind of iconic signs um, that maybe don't fit neatly within the, the regulations and the size, um, but would bring, um, you know, something distinctive to the community. So this is uh, the criteria that the Planning Commission came up with for um, giving the DRB some ability to review, um, you know, different types of signs that somebody might want to use. Um, and it would require conditional use approval. So it would be a public hearing. And then, then the criteria is listed there. Um, we talked about campgrounds. Um, and uh, I think that, that Tom will probably have a change here. Um, again, another error in how this came through. Um, but we talked about campgrounds and having them be open year round. Um, and the, the new language number five is really meant to allow that year round, which you'll see number one still remains. So planning commission, take note of that. Um, but we're saying that it could be open year round, but the water supply and wastewater needs to be in compliance with the state regulations. Um, with single room occupancies, um, we felt like there were a lot of requirements that um, was requiring a lot of additional kind of common space that could increase the cost of creating single room occupancies. So um, we wanted to get rid of some of that common area, but still make sure that there was the provision of kitchens and cleaning areas and um, washing machines and drying machines. So that was the genesis of these um, single room occupancy changes. Um, but, and this is just the remainder of the language. There was no change here. Um, and then these are some other ways that we're um, easing up on the regulations. So we have a cottage cluster planned unit development and we're proposing to relax a lot of the design requirements. So certain things that you see there are that um, roofs need to be at a certain pitch and they need to be one and a half, uh, the buildings need to be one and a half stories. 
And what we were finding as staff is that we wanted to point tiny home developments and, and things like that to the cottage cluster PUD, but the design um, restrictions were, or the design regulations were too restrictive. So um, since the regulations were adopted, we've not seen any of the cottage cluster planned unit developments used as, as a tool to kind of create small communities. Um, and so we're hopeful that with getting rid of some of the design standards, uh, people will be more free to um, create nice communities um, that serve what the public is looking for. Um, for accessory structures, um, we currently allow sheds with a maximum footprint of 200 square feet to be located five feet from the rear and side property lines. Um, we want to expand that to allow workshops and studios and other one-story accessories that aren't used for habit, human habitation. So it, it might be somebody's painting studio or it might be a shed. Um, we don't really care the use of it. We're more interested in um, the size and that the, um, it's not being used for habitation. Not that they can't be, there's just a different setback. Um, for inns, um, we currently require that parking not be located between the building and the street. Um, we have inns in the more rural parts of town um, where there, it doesn't really make sense to have this restriction. So um, we want to get rid of that restriction. Um, we have parking standards for mini warehouse storage, and this was kind of an error. Um, the new proposal would be to allow for four, par four parking spaces plus two for a manager's quarters if there were managers. Um, as you can imagine, many warehouse storages have a lot of impervious surface anyway, because people just drive up. We don't need a lot of extra parking on top of that. And the current regulations um, are excessive in that way. And then another way that we're easing up the regulations is to allow retaining walls in the industrial zoning district to be higher than 16 feet. Um, a lot of the land in the Industrial zoning districts is difficult to develop. It's it's steep. Um, there, so retaining walls are required, and the current regulations don't allow a um, a, retain, a retaining wall over 16 feet. So um, this is something we ran into with site plan review over the years as well. Um, and then there's a couple of ways that we're proposing tightening up the regulations. So one of them is um, we currently, when a large development comes in and um, resurfaces a parking lot, they don't need a permit for that. And uh, some of the parking lots are really big. There's a lot of pavement, there's no landscaping, there's, um, you know, they're just creating a lot of stormwater runoff. So we're proposing that a permit be required and that it's, um, you know, it, it might need to be, might need to come into compliance um, because it's just better for the environment. Um, so this would require a permit for resurfacing, um, for restriping if you're changing the configuration of drive aisles and the, or the number of parking spaces. If you're just restriping because the paint has worn off, that, that would not require coming in for site plan review. Um, if you're regrading an existing parking lot, because again, you're really getting into construction there um, and it's a good opportunity to bring it up into compliance. And if you're um, modifying, adding or altering the existing on-site parking lot landscaping or landscape planters. Um, we have, we currently have an exemption for stormwater, um, and we've seen a lot of development fall into this, um, because you'll see in the strikeout language that this exemption applies if, um, if the developer or the, the site is not increasing the amount of impervious surface by a thousand square feet or more, um, if the pre-existing uh, pre amount of impervious surface on the lot does not exceed 10% or by 500 square feet or more, if the pre-existing amount of impervious surface exceeds 10% of the total lot area. So I would say B is the one that we feel um, a lot of development you know, continues, can, can not have to bring their stormwater systems into compliance because they're really not, um, changing much, but at the same time, they might be investing a lot in their building 
Um, and again, stormwater compliance is increasingly falling on the municipality. So uh, we'd like some sort of way to uh, get compliance to help bring down costs for everybody. And then um, another way that we're tightening up is in the sign regulations. So we have this exemption where if a business um, has a name change or um, you know, maybe they were a part of a franchise and now they're not, if there's been no change in the ownership, but they have a name change and they're replacing the sign that they can have it be, you know, they, could, they don't have to come into compliance. And um, we've got some large signs and this continues happening over and over again. Um, this was um, something that when we adopted the regulations in, the, in 2015, um, there was some of this going on where they were no longer part of the franchise and they were going at it individually. And um, so th this was kind of a concession um, at that time. Um, so that the entire regulations would be passed, uh, but it doesn't really, in, you know, nonconformities, if they're changing, should be brought into compliance. That is kind of what land use regulations are about and, and zoning. Um, so to have this continuing allowance for nonconformity to just kind of continue to exist, um, it, it's just, we don't feel like it's good practice. And so we'd like to see that removed. And then finally, the last amendment is um, to, we have an energy conservation criteria that we look at during site plan review, um, when it's, or sorry, during conditional use review. Um, we'd like to apply that energy conservation to site plan review as well. So it's just an, another added um, review criteria. There's several of them, um, but we think it would be good practice to, um, to have that be a criteria as well, especially as we're thinking about how to be um, about climate change and um, how we can improve our built landscape. So that is the end of the presentation. Um, okay. Um, I think um, the public can stay throughout the rest of the meeting but I think we'll give this last chance to, um, to make any, any comments. Um, and then if we see none, then let's move on to, oh, sure, okay. Yeah, feel free to stay around, stick around. And, you know, I don't think we're, we're so strict that if you do have a question or, you know, an important point, we won't take it going forward. So um, anyway, let's open the, um, the regular public meeting part of this and um, start off with announcements, if there are any. Tom, can I just ask oh, you sure. to um, officially close the public hearing or? Oh, sure. Nobody wants yeah. to have any, if the public has no more comments, just officially close it at the time. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, if there's no more public comment, maybe I'll make this even more official and ask for a motion to close the public hearing from a commissioner. I would like to make a motion to close the public hearing. Okay, is there a second? I Dan second. stands up. Uh, I heard Gary though, so whichever <laughs> one takes precedent. All in favor? Thumbs aye. up. Or aye. Great, <laughs> Prudence, Doran, Gary, Dan. Okay, so the public hearings adjourns. Um, let's call to order our regular public meeting. Okay, bye Kay, thank you. Um, let's start off with announcements if there are any from anyone. Sue, usually Hi. usually, uh, usually <laughs> you have some, but. Yeah, um, I, I have um, probably two announcements that um, kind of pertain to the planning commission. I wanted to let you know that um, we have hired a planning tech um, who is, scheduled to uh, start on June 1st, and that the planning department will also have a summer intern, um, and she will start uh, May 23rd. So you will probably meet them both at some point at our meetings, um, and they're bringing additional capacity, which we're 
pretty excited for. Was that the one that Mr. Gramansky held? Was it that yes. position? Yep, ah. he was the planning technician. Yep. Good news. Yeah, so those are my announcements. Okay, great. Um, yeah, the preferred siting subcommittee is moving along with its work, and maybe maybe next meeting we'll, you know, present some draft document or something like that to the to the commission. Yep, Gary. Yeah, I guess at the question I was asking, I didn't know something like that when when we have uh, those type of proposals, we don't go to the sites to just get a visual. I mean, I'm I love graphs. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Um, but I don't know, we don't go out there to look at these things, just, just to get an idea of what, what we're really, what, what it's about with the flooding, how it looks, what, how it affects the buildings and the people. Because I, um, I know that people were mentioning about the, uh, dis, I don't know if it's displacement, re relocation and displacement of a certain amount of people. Uh, I was just trying to get an understanding of how, how that worked. And if, if there was a backup, just like that happened at the last place, I think it was on Putney Road that flooded and they relocated it everybody up by Walgreens and that was being built. I'm, I'm just trying to get an understanding, get a, you know, concept how that works. Cause if they don't agree or, you know, they're saying how many people we be displaced that are renters and who's on what type of particular program that are renting. Like if it's through section eight or through Windsor, Windsor housing, or if they brought their own trail, I mean, how does that trickle down and affect it in that way with those different organizations too? Yeah. Well, this is my first time running a, you know, or having a public meeting, but I'll, or a public hearing, sorry, but I'll let, I saw Sue's hand up. Ah. Yeah, so um, I, what I would say is I, I think, you know, the planning commission can do a site visit. However, I think you need to keep in mind that it's the planning commission's job, like to, um, it kind of sets policy level or recommends mm -hmm. policy. So to be site specific sometimes, is not really the level that I think is always appropriate. I mean, I, because you're trying to weigh, like uh, in my mind with the flood regulations, right? You're, it has impact, but these people have impact if they're flooded. So, you know, what is, you know, you're trying to weigh a bunch of things um, to figure out what's the best policy move. Um, so I, I'm not saying that you, you don't discount that it, it has effects on people, but um, it's not like the DRB where you are site specific and you're trying to um, review a development on one property. You're trying to apply this policy kind of evenly and fairly throughout town. So, uh, okay. I mean, just like when they're building the bridge or down here, the Amtrak, I, we don't, so it's never been in the history of planning commission to have to go out to a site to search, just to see, to get an idea versus a graft or anything like that. I don't know if it's ever happened before. I would say, well, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would say that um, a time when that seems pretty fitting is, is I've only seen one of, which was that preferred solar site mm -hmm. uh, decision making. And, and, and going forward, it, when and if that happens more, I think, I think that would be smart to do. And in fact, staff did it for us. And, and, and um, you know, Brian and, and Stephen Dotson went and surveyed it and then had some comments. Um, but yeah, going forward, maybe, maybe that's actually something the subcommittee should add to their criteria. <laughs> Commissioners go and, and, and check it out. And see Get how you guys out the office for a little bit. <laughs> so, I mean, I can think of a couple of the times when when um, site visits were done. One was before my time when they were uh, when the planning commission was considering fluvial, fluvial erosion hazard regulations, um, which are pertain to flood. And uh, they walked the whetstone and they saw properties where erosion was happening, and they they walked it with um, staff staff from the state. So, you know, but that was kind of looking at a, yeah, you know, looking at it from a larger picture and trying to understand what was happening on the ground. So, right. I, you know, again, I mean, I think it could be appropriate to go to Tri Park, um, but site visits that the Planning Commission typically do require a, a lot of um, advanced work. 
you know, you wouldn't want to go out there without maps because we want to know what the base flood elevation or the base flood deaths are right. there. So um, it's because you're trying to look at it holistically, it's a little bit different. Another time when we were doing the zoning regulations and trying to figure out where the boundaries of the district should be. So, you know, we're walking on Main Street and we're trying to figure out where's the edge, where yeah. the buildings change here. So maybe we should put the boundary here. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, it's appropriate for site. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and I think Gary also a little broader than site visiting when we've done them, uh, I think around the time we were we were doing the the CLG certified local government mm -hmm. um, talk, there was there was schedule a scheduled visit from a state historian, and there was walks around the two uh, historic neighborhoods, like info walk and talk those sort of things. And when we th did the downtown design plan, you know the consultants had yes. interactive walk and talks as well. So they I think they happen just in a different form. Uh, yes, I agree. Right. Right versus the DRB, or if you're going out like select board, because they have to look at the plan, how they're going to be incorporating and building certain areas. It's like with the bridge project and with Amtrak and any other big major project, or I, I guess they went out to the water treatment to see how that was going to be going. So things like that, but we're on a whole separate yeah. uh, level with it when it comes to that uh, type of planning. Right. Um. Yeah, Dan, I see your hand up. Yeah, hi. Uh, just, uh, I understand there's, uh, I, I just would add to what uh, Sue was saying about the policy implications and the considerations, you know, just to keep in mind, I think two big concepts. One is the context is always kind of difficult to grasp because, you know, you're relativizing to, different situations. So it would be nice to go and visit, right? And and maybe even have pictures, like maybe Sue could put an actual site, you know, picture of the 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 contour or something, you know, whether it's a graph or you know a, a diagram of the contour of the land or an actual picture, you know, of like an example of a house. It's it would be helpful for sure to be able to see things in context. Uh, but the context is really complicated. That's kind of part of the you know, there's a historical context as well as the just the space that you're talking about. And I, I just wanted to kind of put uh, out there, I wasn't involved in all the discussions, but I remember discussing the piers and the heights and so forth in a past meeting. And one thing that probably would help think about the context for these things is that this is, for in this example, this is a downstream, literally downstream problem and we have a downstream solution, right? Like at the point, at the, at the, the location of the if issue. I mean, if you were to think in larger terms, building a dam or building levees or building, you know, doing some big public works project might be a good alternative, but actually we, I don't think we have the alternative to think about that so much. Uh, so that, you know, that that's where things get difficult. In any case, the, the last thing I wanted to say was that the, the maps that uh, Sue gave us were, if you noted in the, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, it said they were produced by LIDAR, you know, that, that the actual uh, elevations and so forth were, were, were mapped using a, a new form of radar, essentially, uh, very accurate. And I think the technology that we're that we're using to make those judgments can be trusted more and more. So I, I think sometimes we just have to kind of let go and not do the site visit, not do the, the kind of big picture thinking that we might want to do because we have really good pictures already, literally high tech pictures of, of what's, what the situation is. And, and as hard as it is to, 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 to grapple with, they didn't have that technology whenever it was that they built the mobile parks. They didn't have the experience of the, of the flood and so forth. So we have to grapple with the fact that, you know, we have what we have, you know, that's not kind of what I wanted to say. I, I know it's, it's, it, it's not, doesn't make it any better. <clears throat> sorry, I just wanted to, I'm no. sorry to go on a tirade there, no. but, but it, no. yeah, I know it's all very frustrating. Uh, I, I totally get it. I mean, I, I hear, 
hear you, but Doran can speak also. Yep. Um, well, I just wonder quickly though, if Gary, you have a quick response to that or if you're gonna bring up a, a different point. Well, no, no, I, I agree. I'm gonna be real quick. It's just, I agree because you guys have come before and Sue has perfect aerial views of the area satellite wise rather than, you know, color. And it, it, it gives you a broader eye, a look of how it looks in that flood area and how the buildings are aligned versus a graph. I mean, then you have a better perspective with the context and how and how it's structured and how it looks. So that way you can understand which houses are in that particular versus, you know, shaded reds and all that. So I can say, yeah, these buildings are in a bad area, you know, versus just looking at a picture with different colors. It's pretty hard to really get the concept um, to an extent where if you see a, a perfect visual, like we do with the buildings like downtown or they show the pictures of the Amtrak and, and all that, you have a, a, a clarification of how to, to give a better idea of where you want to go with it. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> I just want to say, but I'll call on you, Dora, in just a second, that we're going to, um, this is the announcements. And I think, you know, the questions and the points people are bringing up fit within this, but we're going to do the um, the minutes and then, uh, and then discuss the public hearings comments and then make our decision about um, about what to do, what changes to make, if any, and, and, and what to, to move it forward or not. So, yep, so no hands up. Um, is there a motion to approve the, the April 5th minutes? Yeah, Prudence, you want to make that? I think you have to say something. <laughs> Speak it for all of us. You're on mute, Prudence. Yeah, you're on mute. <laughs> I keep on muting in the wrong spot. Yes, so I I move I move that we approve the April fifth minutes. And I second it. Gary seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Everyone. Okay. Um, so now let's let's go to the last part. Um, well, we do have a public comment, another public comment uh, slot at the very end. But anyway, um, yeah, let's discuss what we heard and how, what, if at all, we want to uh, assimilate that into our, into the amendments or change them or, um, can I, can I start off with some notes I made that will maybe um, work through some of the ones that aren't flood stuff and get them out of the way quickly? Okay, there was that camping um, sort of error that was made. Um, Cause I think we had all agreed in previous meetings to strike the, uh, the seasonal limitation on camping in cabins and things like that at campgrounds. Um, I wish Jessica stayed on. Um, I remember when she was still a commissioner, when we were talking Sue and whoever else, you know, Doran and, and Prudence were there too, I think, about the, um, the parking structures in the service center. She brought up, well, maybe we should keep it, maybe, you know, remove it from permitted, like proposed, but put it in conditional. And I think her rationale, and I, I think, you know, we all agreed with it, was that, um, um, you know, we don't want, want more parking, but a parking structure can consolidate parking into multiple levels. And who knows what sort of planning and developments will come, but maybe if we feel like we already have too much parking lots up there, this having, having that as a possibility could actually consolidate it and, and help um, there be less surface area parking. And I think, I think we all, you know, I don't think anyone opposed it. I don't know if we all took a vote. Uh, we, we didn't formalize it, but so I don't know if we can tack that in unless anyone's opposed or has clarifying questions to ask about that. Well, I don't know if I can abstain. I wasn't there at the time when you guys put this together. Right. So I don't know if my vote would really count because <laughs> I didn't really. Well, we're making, yeah, well, we're making changes now. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you have questions about it or an alternative, uh, I would I would prefer to wait so I can you know digest this some more. Like I said, we I just yeah. got the information and I've never really asked the questions that I want to ask because it's probably take a while. Like, what's this? What's this? Why this? Yeah. So I don't I don't know how you guys feel about that. I guess I get some feedback on the people who yeah. originally did it and anyone else that's new to it. I can just get pretty much an idea. Some of the uh, summarize pretty much what your thoughts were when uh, 
Jessica was on it. Uh, and like I said, I wish she was here so I could pretty much get an idea so I can really make a good, you know, solid vote on this. I could brain it, brainstorm it. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? Absolutely. And, and I think if I, you know, in, in all honesty, if I was better with, uh, you know, not procrastinating, I would have seen the proposed amendments, you know, a few days ago, which I did. And then I would have been like, oh, I see a, a few things. And then I would have submitted it all. And then you guys would have been all prepared with what the, the four things I'm going to say. So, um, but I don't, I don't know. I guess we can, we can put some things off, but um, maybe, maybe Dan uh, first and then Doran have comments on that. Yeah, could I re just respond to the service center? You're making just this point about the service center uh, zoning. Right, because staff came to us, I think, with the proposal to remove parking structures uh, and something else. Right, Th this the just might, this would be a good thing for me to have and maybe to answer Gary's questions. Uh, I, I know that there was a change made in zoning in 2015 and I haven't been able to find the previous zoning map for lack of a, I mean, I, I don't know exactly where it is, but if we knew or what the overlaps of the changes were that were made then, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's possible, but that would help us kind of put that in, put the service center issues and all that into context. Mm. Um, I would, I, that would be a ton of work. I can give you the regulations and I can give you the map, but we strategically did away with them because they were cobbled together with 20 years of amendments and there was like nine zoning districts in the Putney Road area. So it, it, it's not, I have to be very clear, it wouldn't be worth my time to go through, no, but no. I can provide you with materials and just the map. No. background of what we did. But I will say I did just check the minutes from March and um, that was Jessica's uh, motion. So they should have, um, she was looking to see them to go to conditional use, not struck completely. Okay. So yeah, that would so, be for the par surface parking and parking garages. Right, yeah. Yeah, so then that means it goes before the DRB to review yeah. and see if, see if it makes sense in, in their mind to allow it or not, instead of just allowed outright. Um, I think Dorian okay. was uh, waiting. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, actually, I would love to hear the other notes you had, Tom. Before I'll I'll, I'll jump in. So that'd be okay, great. thank you. So I think it sounds like we're moving. We're we're fixing that or adding that in. I don't know if we need to take a, a vote on every little change. No, I think we can take one vote at the end. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So there was that the camping one I already said. Um, for the SROs, you know, I don't know if, if this is me reading into it too much, but the kitchen one that says something like, uh, for, says like for every six, uh, I can yeah, could you, could you read the kitchen one or call it, it up on the screen? Well, yeah. Um, it says like there must be one uh, um, full uh, common kitchen for every six, units or one per floor but I, I think it's missing one little part um, because if all of those units have full kitchens in them mm -hmm. then it's it's like redundant and I think it should say one common full kitchen for every six units without full kitchens or one per floor okay so it says um i know it's hard to think of things if a just full hearing them. kitchen uh yeah if a full kitchen is not provided in each unit one full common kitchen must be provided for every six units or one per floor yeah yeah i feel like that's thinking of it as if the sros will either be all all of them will have full kitchens or all of them won't but it could be that some of them do and some of them don't so it should be i think for every six that don't have it there has to be one full one or one per floor. Because if let's say there's let's say there's 18 SROs and 17 of them have full kitchens, only one doesn't. Then there would need to be three common full kitchens. Hmm. One yep. per six, right? Yep. But there's only one without it, so there should only need to be one common kitchen because everyone else has their own. 
Yep. That makes sense. There's probably all sorts of alternative situations that are. Did you have specific language that you wanted? I think just the, just the phrase uh, without full kitchens um, right after. Yeah. So for every six units um, without full kitchens or, or one per floor. Okay. I think makes it a lot more sensical. Does everyone have a, does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, the last part is a pretty, pretty minor. It was in that figure where it says beyond district setbacks. Remember that Sue? Um, and I just found, I just felt, felt like that word is confusing. I, like, I still don't think that it's clear that it means like into the property or towards the road. Yes, I'm gonna. That we're beyond. But what it means is that like, if, if, if these like porches or awnings or stuff are, are encroaching into the setback, like that's what the note is referring to. And so if it just said into instead of beyond, but I mean, <laughs> I think that's something where if anyone has questions, they can just call staff and ask, but um, I think it's also good for the, you know, document to be, uh, to make sense for any average reader. Is this the note that you were talking about? Yep, Tom? that's it. note one and two. Yeah, and I brought that up at a meeting. Um, yep. So it's not like, you know, I'm not just coming up with it now. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't think anyone said anything to the contrary. It seemed to make sense or people didn't have an opinion one way or the other. Um, yeah, those are the minor ones. Um, I, I didn't, nothing was mentioned before about retaining walls um, I, or, or I, I just had a question about it at the meeting we discussed. But then since then, I've gone around town and, and I've thought like of that, you know, the kind of cool looking, in my opinion, like slate retaining walls behind the parking garage or behind the, um, that sort of defunct dry cleaners across from McNeil's. Mm -hmm. And those are way over 16 feet. Um, so I mean, if retaining, if someone was proposing retaining walls over 16 feet made of like just, you know, bland concrete for, a, for an aesthetic sense, I would, I would, you know, my personal opinion would be that, yes, we should not allow that except in the industrial zone like proposed. But if it's going to be what I think is that, you know, nice slate, then I don't know, maybe that's something we should think about going in, in the future. But mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that or. If that's a if that somehow can be an easy change or Sue or anyone. Um, I'm looking at the existing language language yeah. to see. Um, I mean, some of it may be a safety issue, but it, as long yeah. as they're designed and engineered appropriately, I, I think it. I, I don't think it detracts from the you know aesthetics of you know the developed areas at all. If it was concrete, sure. But. It wasn't an aesthetics issue that was the driver on the, it was more of not wanting excessive cutting and filling and more kind of working with the landscape. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, instead of just cutting a road in, why don't you kind of work a little bit more and have curves? Um, okay. So it was more safety. Plus we have so many retaining walls in town and they get built and then, you know, over the years kind of, yeah. yeah, it's more just kind of a follow up question and something I wanted to explore really quickly. I don't, I don't feel strongly one way or the other unless, unless someone else wants to chime in on that. But. Did, did it have to do, Tom, with anything dealing with ADA also, compliancy or no? No. Okay. Yeah. It's just allowing a little more possibility in the industrial district, you know, is ah. the proposal for, for, for making the land work for industrial. Um, possibilities but I thought maybe that could you know apply elsewhere but I definitely hear the the idea of working with the land um, I don't have anything else except you know I think we'll all discuss the flood stuff can I point out because I really don't want it to be lost would be the neighborhood center and the service center the error that I had made in that one sure um, to take Canal Street out of the service center description and leave it in the neighborhood center. Yep. So, so what's the difference between neighborhood center and service center? I'm on Canal Street. I'm just 
kind of get an idea. <laughs> yeah, so you're actually, I think, in the mixed use zoning district. So yeah, the, much. <laughs> the service center is really kind of more the larger footprint buildings that is designed to, um, or it's, it's Putney Road. It's kind of the area that um, attracts not only locals, but kind of people coming in for major shopping trips, if you're thinking the grocery store and whatnot. Um, at one point, we had thought of having some of Canal Street in the service center as well, but the development pattern is different. That's kind of like the 1960s commercial development that happens on Canal Street from, you know, exit one down to kind of the hospital. And mm -hmm. so it was a di different scale of development. So that's kind of, you know, there's neighborhoods. We'd like to see neighborhoods in the service center. We'd like to see more residential, but it doesn't currently exist. It's kind of the 1980s um, car oriented commercial development where Canal Street, it's still car oriented, but there is a mix of neighborhoods and sidewalks and kind of right. people living, you know, right off of that. So just different scale. Even with the co-op at, at the bottom of the hill too, that would that what would that be considered? That's a, the that's in the urban center zoning district. Ah, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, when we had that that screen share still up, I wasn't able to see the uh the hands. Um but now okay. you know, I, I thought to look at it. So um I see Doran's first and then Dan's. Uh first of all, I just want to thank Sue for that the presentation. It's so helpful for dyslexic people like myself. I can read through the notes and it's just like I just their numbers and words don't I like auditorily helps a lot. So thank you for that. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, I just a, a couple of things that uh, that pop through uh, without uh, before that uh, getting into the, the, the flood zoning. Um, I was just gonna say, Tom, I, yeah, I, if there's cement walls, but like we make sure that there's initiatives to make sure that they're all painted beautiful murals like that's that's, uh, I think that's pretty all right. Um, I think it's just about how creative we get with it uh, community wise. Um, I was curious about what um, zoning could be put in or what uh, maybe may, uh, like what could be put in to help promote once again, alternative forms of uh, housing, uh, like tiny house communities. I'm not too sure what in that, uh, in our rules are necessarily prohibitive to that. There might not be any. There may be some that I didn't catch. Um, so that was just something I was also just keeping in mind for, like you know, to help support the creation of yeah. I don't know if it was tiny home parks or whatever. Um, uh, I, I've really just been uh, I've been thinking so much about uh, gentrification and the cost of all things, especially during COVID. I think we've just seen such an insane amount of uh, cost and kind of wealth. Uh, did, did, did kind of uh, the distribution being very uh, skewed. Uh, so I, I just, I can't help but not think of like what can be done to help support, um, you know, yeah, just simply the fact that like, like uh, my partner and I are, are trying to build a tiny home and we, we can't afford it <laughs> right now. We can't even afford the wood. I mean, like it really is like 200% cost. So I was thinking about that just in connection to any type of person who wanted to build uh, any type of like uh, alternative way of living or even just doing your renovations to make more space. It's just so unaffordable. And it's really been within like six months, the cost has gone up by about like 75%. So it's happening so fast. So I just can't, I just kind of keep coming back to what can be done, um, you know? So, but in terms of like all the, all the other laws, they sound pretty good. And then we'll get to the discussion on, uh, on, the, on the flood, uh, on the flood zoning. And that's just my two cents there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just say a couple things quick. Um, uh, after hearing, or you know, the rationale for the um, the, the 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 wall limit again from Sue, I'm uh, I wouldn't say I'm compelled either way. So I I personally just want to put off that that kind of loose proposal I had um, for adding it to other zones. But you know, unless other people feel compelled, um, I feel like what we might do is before moving to the flood, we might vote on everything else that we've just talked about and heard and yay or nay it. And then we'll talk about the flood thing and then yay or nay that. Um, and regarding uh, what we can do about, um, you know, tiny housing and, and just helping people out in general with housing. Um, I guess I would say, you know, there's there's more things we can do than the, than the, the land use regs, but like 
even though we're in the midst of this this process, I already have a list of not necessarily tiny home related, but a few things, um, you know, for our next land use regs amendment time. So as I was, you know, Sue and I were talking on the phone a few days ago, this is not this is not the last land use reg amendments process. It's a uh, as soon as we stop one, we can start we can start you know compiling a list and having meetings talking about the next ones. Um, so, uh, Dan. Yeah, I, I didn't want to reply to any. I wanted to, can, are you, you got through your four? Yep. Okay. Can I just add two more? I, I think that I'm not entirely clear on. Sure. Uh, one is uh, under, uh, in proposed amendments to attached housing, uh, 303A, uh, under building design. Now, the one that's been scratched, that's been uh, cut out is attached garages. Now, I, I know that, of course, that has to do with the building design of, uh, of a residence, but could we either, I mean, this may be for a future change, but um, could someone explain to me, you know, if, if that has to do with the design of a residential uh, uh, living space, right? You know, uh, facing the, the, the street and so forth. Um, or if it's actually an accessory, not a, it's not an, it's not an attached dwelling, it's a garage. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought you were just searching for the word detached. No, no. If it's still attached, but if it, but, if it, but it's not a dwelling, it's, um, it's, it, it, the section is building design, attached dwelling units must be designed in accordance with the following. And then it has attached garages. And I get it with the vehicle entrance and all that, but mm. shouldn't there be either a separate section or, I mean, I don't even know why that's in there. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not the dwelling itself. Sure. So that's a question. I guess if you have a quick answer, I. Yeah, no, I think Sue, I mean, I can explain it, but Sue can explain it really well. Okay. Yeah, so um, probably the best thing I could do is let me see if I can um, pull up some images we had looked at. What we didn't want here is snow. We didn't want garages that took over the street. Mm -hmm. um, and the building entrance was way in the back. We wanted to kind of preserve the streetscape and kind of this um, public realm, even though it's private property. So we didn't want the kind of called snout housing. Yeah, um, I, I understand with, that. And, but I, I guess yeah. it could be in a separate section if you were focusing on that, uh, but I don't know. Well, it does apply elsewhere in town, but so it's just attached guys, you know, if we we're gonna have a bunch of condominiums or attached um, homes, we wanted it to apply there, I guess. Um, I guess I'm not really understanding the way you're reading it. Or... Yeah, I guess I don't, I mean, I understand the snout house argument and, and all mm -hmm. that, and, and that, you know, it could be even more explicitly put in here if you were to even make another section that doesn't have to do with attached, because it's not an attached dwelling. That's all, that's all I'm getting at. Unless it, if it's a garage with an attached dwelling, on the second floor or something like that, then I can see why it would be in there. It's a dwelling for your car, I guess, if anything, right? But it's not a dwelling for people. But it's attached to the dwelling unit. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I, I guess that's, it's neither here nor there. I just was kind of not clear on whether that kind of deserves its own uh, section or, yeah. you know, highlighting even. Oh, are you saying maybe just it, it, in the land use regs in general, applying to like all residences, maybe there should be, there should be like rules about where the garage entrance is or not? That's one, that's one a avenue for sure. If you had a, a See what you mean, you know, it's, right. it's, it's in the attached housing section yeah. and that's not attached housing. You know what I mean? It's attached to the housing. Yeah, I mean, it has to do with the design of the attached housing. It yeah. does show up in a graphic, I think, in the residential neighborhood that um, 
so this same thing applies. It can't be out in front of the building if it's attached. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's there, but I, I hear what you're saying now. I understand it better. Um, yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, if, if there's some sort of, you know, uh, 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 intention behind it, then it would be good to flesh it out, you know, if, the, if that's yeah. kind of in there. Yeah. The other thing was about, I, you know, I have this in a, <laughs> I'll switch to the other document. The, this is about signage and um, a concern or a uh, uh, sort of a, a I, I'm not, I'm not entirely believing what, what, uh, what I, see in there. Uh, this is in, uh, in under signage, pr proposed signage changes, uh, uh, under prohibited signs. I don't know if you want to call it up. That'd be great if you could. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, towards the beginning, 319C. Yep, 319C. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, uh, the one, uh, number 15, if you scroll down a little bit more, uh, signs placed on vehicles or trailers that are parked for the primary purpose of displaying the sign. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's even enforced or uh, is that something that you should attach a time limit to? Or is it something, you know, uh, if you look at it, you know, it, or is it, you know, I don't know. Is that is that sort of like a fining situation? If you're really going to enforce it, it is. We have done enforcement on this. Um, okay. There's a couple of uh, establishments in town that that use this. Um, and so, you know, with our enforcement, we generally start with a gentle prod, and you know. Okay. Yeah, as long so as it's it enforced. Has been enforced. I, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And usually it goes uh, yeah. away for a little bit and then comes back, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because I can see the point of having that in there, but it's, I don't, I don't know how it, but yeah, if you can have a process to enforce it, that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, Does this apply to, say, a, a box van that has, you know, yeah. um, uh, an image printed on it? Is, is that a sign? Or is that a printed vehicle? <laughs> It's a sign placed on, like, so we'd view it. So we'd view that and we check to make sure it moves. <laughs> Let's put right, it okay. Way. You know, yeah, so I'll... it's not the easiest thing to enforce against. There are businesses that will park a vehicle out in front. It's kind of when you drive by it day after day after day, week after week, and you notice it's not moving. That's the kind of thing we'll attempt to enforce on. There's other ones that might just, you know, be a company car that is roadworthy and it's parked out in front of the business. That's not something that we're necessarily going to go right for because that's, you know, they're just branded and they're driving it for work and it, you know, does move around. But there are definitely some stationary ones in town. Yeah, they're kind of like it, without that prohibited provision. It's kind of like they're using a loophole. But it's for all for all other intensive purposes. It's basically a sign. It's just in a parking lot instead of so on the building. It's a, yeah, it's a mobile sign. You know, it, it's something you can move around to a strategic location too. Yeah. Essentially, having like a billboard where you wherever you want to park it. Yeah, I would say um, most of the ones. That, there is one that I know that has moved around at a couple of different properties the person owns, but. Um, most of them do stay in its their place, and so it's it's a bit easier to at least <laughs> attempt to enforce. Yeah, that was my question. Great, thanks. Okay. Yeah, is there any other um, changes or or proposals or additions or subtractions besides the flood stuff? Um, and if not, can we uh, can someone craft a motion to? What should we say exactly? I mean. I, I think I think we're going to do a motion on on this on this cluster, and then a motion on the flood thing, and then and then we need to. Well, no. I guess I guess we can uh, entertain a motion to um, to approve all of everything besides that we've heard and the flood, mm -hmm. um, besides the flood, and uh, and pass it along, move it forward to the select board. If someone can state that more clearly mm -hmm. than me. 
Do you have the agenda? I think I did a proposed motion on the agenda. Right. Ah, let's see. I can pull it up. Motion. So let's see. There. If I, shall I share my screen again? One more sure. time. Uh, like I put my glasses on. <laughs> Let's see. But whoever whoever makes that motion will have to modify it a little bit in okay. accordance with you know. So would that be the one between seven thirty yeah. and five? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So without the land regulation. Without the flood hazard at this moment. Uh, then I would motion to submit the proposed amendment to the Brattleboro Land Use Regulation as amendment and written report to the select board for their consideration to file a copy with the town clerk for public review with the exception of the land regulation. Flood hazard regulation. I'm sorry, flood hazard regulation. Correction. Okay. Is there a second? Prudence. Seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. How about Doran, or is there a nay? In favor. Sorry, right. I thought I had my camera on. <laughs> anyone abstain? <laughs> the staff does. As I they never should. hear that. Is anyone abstain? We're not voting. Ah. We're not voting members. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, I think we just have less left discussion about the flood, uh, the, the proposed flood amendment. What do people think? What do we want to do? Well, I might come up with a proposal probably next month about what uh, Dorian was talking about in regards to types of housing. But I got to look into this particular organization first to see if they still have a pulse. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Sue or Tom. It's called Habitat for the Humanity. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. I spoke to one of the gentlemen. They said it still exists but there's no one running it. Uh, and I was gonna speak to them, they are gonna send me the paperwork. So I was gonna probably get with you and Sue on that and anyone else who's interested in getting with the organization because they do have Habitat for Humanity outside of Brattleboro. There was a person running it at one time. Uh, and I spoke to the gentleman, he said, if you're willing to step up and get other people, but uh, I would first have to look a little bit more into that to see what, uh, what they're looking for because um and as far as regulations because the times have changed as we know so just i guess to get an idea of what direction or if it's something that's going to be applicable or suitable and if they're part of the sustainability also um for the future so i'm going to give the gentleman and them a call again um i spoke to them prior before my last surgery so i'll give them a call again and i'll pass that along to you i guess sue and time and um see what thoughts we have we'll bring it to the agenda i guess the next meeting and see uh if that's uh okay with you guys and see what we could do yeah yeah be interesting to explore that and see if we can um prudence oh sorry i saw it and then doran after prudence gary do you mean like whether habitat for humanity could help folks at the mountain home trailer park that and also with transitioning from most of the hotels, I think they had a broader, I, I have to find out, like, like I said, it's changed and, I, and regulation. So I got to see, I'm going to get all the information first and I guess have Sue and Tom look it over and see if it also fits with the new regulations zoning, all that. Um, so I have to check again to see if it's been updated and where they're at with that. And I had, I had, a contact person so i gotta see if they're around also because they like i said they had someone running it but it's not gone but there's no one's at the helm again they need someone at the helm so i want to look into that and see where that can go with that also and that, that was a, that's a great program also uh, i'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that and that'd be something too for people that are living in brattleboro we have a lot of land and um maybe that can be part of some type of sustainability as well also well, I also wanted to say, I, I think on the flood hazard, at first it seemed, when we first discussed it, it almost sounded like it was really a question of, you know, simply, you know, are we going to save folks, make flood insurance more affordable 
or um, for everybody who who has it versus you know the interest of the of folks at the trailer park but it's it's more complicated than that um, mm. and you know Brian brought up some uh, I think concerns it's just that it's it's very complex when you get into FEMA buyouts or FEMA assistance and so on I I don't think there's an easy answer, um, but I also, and I'm very concerned that we might pass a reg that, you know, um, does create an, an immediate, well, it's not immediate because it depends on whether the, it's really, I guess it, does it, is it really more relevant when there's actually a flood event? Mm. Or I, I would construction? Maybe Brian can answer that first. I, he's the floodplain coordinator, if you don't mind, Doran, sorry. Um, yeah, so at this point, there are about three pads that are open, and they haven't been able to find a way to redevelop those pads, and those pads would be impacted by this particular regulatory change. Um, so it seems like the existing regulations are already a barrier to redeveloping those pads. And the rate of pads being cleared off and ready for redevelopment seems to be maybe one every couple of years. So that would be about the pace of it. If there is a flood event, this exception does not apply in any case. So you would have to have it elevated to two feet above base flood elevation. And again, that's where your hazard mitigation funds could help out. But the, the other thing is the issues are complex and you don't, you can't necessarily approach them through regulatory changes or the existing regulations, which is why the town has been working with them on the master plan, because um, we realize that the existing conditions are in some ways a trap for them. Uh, Doran. Oh, hold on a second. I think, I, I don't know how, how uh, by the book we want to go here, but in our rules of procedure, you know, and according to the agenda, we're supposed to stop at eight, but with a majority vote, we can continue to a certain time, but no later than 8.30. So um, I guess we can just say 8.30, but we could finish early. Is everyone up for that? Do we, I don't, I don't think it has to be, okay. All right, everyone put their thumbs up. So um, let's continue, Doran. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, uh, yeah, obviously, it's it's so complicated. And I know a big part of it is like state regulation. Um, I just can't, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess I just keep thinking about I was just reading about the uh, relocation of, uh, like giant homeless sites in, uh, in Austin, Texas, a big part of it, they were saying is that the people where a lot of people were camping was in a flood zone. And they were saying to protect the people they had to move them out of their temporary housing, the flood zone, but then you just moved a bunch of people that already did not have a home to somewhere else in like the, in the preparation of, for disaster. And it just sort of like, I, 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 that was kicking around my brain a little bit with this. Cause I just don't, I just, it's so hard to be for, for any type of regulation that at all begin to start to curtail like very more limited housing that could affect up to a thousand people, depending, even if, yeah, so much, so much is outside of our of our ability um, is more state wise. I just like like yeah, the idea that you need sixteen to twenty feet worth of ramp of like of like stilted house to be able to move the cost of moving those and or building anything new. Like all of a sudden, just like it just seemed more and more like very simple when we were talking about it, but then listening to other people got more and more just preposterous in the like just unaffordable for literally anyone let alone for 70 however many units would at some point have to come across this this law um either with a flood or with doing enough renovations to their house and they're like sorry you can't do that much unless you now prop it up on you know, like 16 to 20 feet worth of of yeah so i just i don't know yeah i'm all for supporting you know environmental regulations but when they legitimately move huge populations that can't afford anywhere else it just seems it seems so contradictory because the whole goal of protecting the environment you have to protect the most vulnerable first 
because they're not at, at fault for the majority of this problem. And the most vulnerable in our community, are, you know, that is, it's, it's that community. You know, it's a, the thousand of our, our more lower income neighbors. So I just can't, I just can't get behind anything that would increase and make their, like, uh, make it more difficult. Yeah, um, I completely, uh, you know, agree with the, the again, the, the principle of uh, what you're saying. And I think we all agree that it's a, it's sort of an injustice that's built into the system of, you know, the value of land and, you know, uh, why is that, you know, why are the, uh, why is the mobile park home there in the first place, really? Um, Unfortunately, I mean, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, we the best of intentions can ha can backfire. Unfortunately, uh, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, I, I wish there were a middle ground here. You know, it would be nice to be able to compromise with, you know, with in some way. Uh, but you can't compromise with the flood. The flood is the you know it is where it is and. Uh, uh, honestly, because you have that system, I, I think that you're, I think we all agree that the residents are the ones who are the victims of this. Uh, but there were other people responsible before this. And, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, sometimes if you make a tough decision of, you know, that has to do with a lot of people, those are the people who kind of need to then uh, whether it's in the case of any any situation like this, uh, they you know they can actually speak for themselves. I wish we had more of them speaking today, um, and maybe that that's I I'm thinking that you know the reality of the situation uh, could be explained better, and if you made a more effort to explain it and I, not that sue you did a great job with you know the presentation but i mean the on the ground with each individual resident uh they they, they have tough decisions to make based on their facts on the ground and so i i, I don't think i would uh be comfortable uh, you know making a decision that where they aren't informed that in reality, they they could be at very high risk. I mean, that's no joke. You know, obviously we all know that, but um, you know, it could happen this year. It could happen in ten years. But regardless, it it at some point something's going to happen, which we might regret not having changed it. That's all I'd want to say. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, I guess I feel the same way, Dan, is um, I guess this goes back just like I remember when me and Sue, when we had to do the police precinct and the fire department, we had that big form of public coming out. And I think that that might be something I was thinking the same thing, too, because I haven't heard from the people yet. I've been up in those parks. I see what they're like. I mean, that's why I was saying a site visit, but knowing their posi their positions and the conditions and all that, and knowing what the people are, even after COVID too, but try to relocate. Um, it's not like the other parks where we were able to build something and relocate these people elsewhere. Um, I, I was just wondering, I don't know, maybe hearing the feedback from them and where that might give me a better clarification of what direction to go uh, as far as voting on this. Because um, it does impact not just those people, but the community, and it impacts in a big fiscal way in a lot of other areas other than just with FEMA, because once these people are displaced, where are you going to put them? So my thoughts on that, um, unless you're going to buy out or whatever, I don't have all the facts. So I'd like to hear, I mean, just, just me, I mean, that's a thought, you know, get some feedback on that to see what they have. That's why I was asking you earlier before, does anybody calling in any I'm just wondering, you know, I don't want to be like a coffee cup. You know, we're closed. You're leaving. You're going to FEMA. That's it. You know, it's not fair. We've already seen how that worked with people. And 
we want to be noticed that we went through and, and, and really, you know, just delved in this and looked in all every all possibilities that we could possibly look and hear the feedback to come with a really good conscious decision on which direction to go that's not just best for the people but best for the community also as well too so we're not putting that extra burden on the town you know because already have people in hotels as it is now and i know a lot of people in those areas up there it's just barely scraping you know, and I don't know. I just think maybe we should take a step back and really hear from their point of view to see what they think. Yeah, I have a couple follow-up points. <clears throat> Not necessarily answers to what you said, Gary, but a couple thoughts. Um, yeah, the, so the two public that, you know, that participated were not in support, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think it's clear. Um, you know, no public offered comments or was here uh, in support of the amendments. Um, in previous meetings, we talked and staff talked about um, a survey mm -hmm. to the to the park members, and I forget the exact reason, but there was a limit of time or or costs or something. But it sounds like to me that this is an you know uh, uh, an important or complex enough issue that maybe we should revisit that. Mm. Um, but I don't know how that might impact delaying the other land use regs. Um, Yeah, so just like, thoughts. Anybody can like spin that. Deadline? Is there a deadline for this to get voted in right away? Or, I mean, like I said, I wasn't there when you guys put this together. I wasn't there when you had the open form. So I'm just getting this now. Yeah, I think Sue can comment on a couple parts. So, yeah, so I'd, cop up, I'd like to comment on a couple of it. So um, I did work on the Tri Park Master Plan. I, if I had to hazard a guess, um, most of the residents would not be in favor of this. Um, Kay, I wish Kay was still here because she is. Mm. Um, she works very closely with people in the community. Um, a lot of people that are in the most vulnerable areas, um, you know, need lots of support from their neighbors. Um, some don't have phones. They don't have computers. They don't, you know, so. K is, you know, and, and some other people at the park are a real lifeline for them. Right. Um, when we were working on the master plan, the response was, are you going to make me move? And we said, we can't make you move. But, you know, there is the threat of the next flood and that may make you move. So, um, you know, there some of the people in these most vulnerable areas have some of the oldest homes in the park that, um, you know, they don't necessarily have the means to make a move. Um, part of the Tri Park Master Plan envisions somebody that can go in and do some housing counseling so that they are aware of what their options are. But this is their home and they, you know, despite the risk, they love their home. Um, in terms of the amendments moving forward, um, the whole public hearing tonight was driven on the fact that if we wanted to be able to maintain that CRS class eight rating, we needed to have this approved by at some point in June. So, you know, that's, it's something we can try to achieve at a later date. If we don't do it for this re-up this year, um, we could go back, we could spend more time on this. That, that is something is but that that was the driver of the zoning amendments. We can still take the rest of the zoning amendments forward with the select board and you know work on getting them passed um, and work on this some more. Yeah, I probably me per I, this is just my I would rather wait and just to to walk away with this with a clear conscience, knowing that I did the right thing. That's just me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, go on. Well, I just want to see is, I mean, is there the possibility of like around that, like some income uh, based exemption or, you know, to be able to move forward with like it, because I, it's just sort of, you know, like, cause also knowing it, chances are that community is also not the community that even has flood insurance. So that's not going to save, like, that's not going to save them any money. It's going to save some other people some money who are like, you know, middle income renters in Brattleboro, but you know, the majority of people will not have flood insurance. And so it's like, I, and it is the kind of thing it's like, well, 
maybe maybe it's it isn't only next year maybe it's 10 years and i i know that you know from folks that i've talked from it's like they will go with the problem they can handle now first you know because when you're in low income you're you're hand to mouth right so like yeah. they would rather just have housing as long as they can have housing and then a flood comes and ruins their life like they will figure it out then but it's like anything that's going to make it more difficult for them now just seems uh, I don't know. I just can't. It's just so hard to just, even though I, I agree on the environmental and I know that another flood is coming, it's like I can't get behind anything that's going to like be like, yeah, well, sorry, but we have to make your life more difficult now. You'll thank us in the future. Doesn't work when you're really poor and you're just living hand to mouth. So, um, uh, so I guess that's that's kind of where I am there. Um, I, I, yeah, I would love to move forward with as much of it as we can. I just, it's hard to get behind that one. I really can't. Yeah, I'll just chime in quick and then Brian, but I'll say that it's <coughs> kind of the way I'm, I'm feeling too. You know, I think a common, um, you know, situation that's kind of like this in some ways is when there's, you know, coastal, coastal homes that get wiped away by hurricanes all the time. And people are like, a lot of people are like, why do people keep building there? And the insurance keeps letting them rebuild and then they do it again and another hurricane comes. But in those situations, the people are often well resourced. So this is a, a different situation, I feel like. There's an extra layer to consider. Uh, Brian. Yeah, so just to be really clear here, this won't impact people who are currently in the park unless they make a substantial improvement to their homes. And most of the folks there can't afford to upgrade to the current regulatory standard. So they refrain from making major improvements to their homes. And that's their strategy of keeping it affordable and, and staying within the regulations. If the regulations become more vigorous, it's still gonna be their strategy. The regulations are only gonna kick in when people make a large investment in their home or they bring a new home to the site. So for the individuals who are there, probably no impact. For the park, a potential because it could make it more difficult to redevelop pads. And you know, I, I think that in part is why we didn't hear from individual homeowners, but we did hear from the park because you know their interest is in maintaining it over time, and this could have an impact on that. More, more discussion, Prudence. Um, I, I, I think we should pass. Well, we've already passed the other ones, and I. I don't want to see the other amendments, you know, wait while we work on this one. I don't think we're going to find, I don't think there is a great zoning solution here. I mean, there's houses that are in a place that really they shouldn't be, but that's where the folks are. They have a home there. It's, there's nowhere else for them to live. Maybe they would move if they could get a comparable situation on, a, on higher ground. They probably would, but that doesn't exist, you know? And so, so it's kind of a, it's a bad situation. I didn't realize until Brian just added that, that this won't change it for people that are, um, that, you know, it really won't change the existing situation for people. So I think that that's important food for thought and another reason we should talk about it more in the future. And, and I hope we do go forward with the rest of the changes. Yep, Gary. Yeah, I'm just going to wrap it up. Uh, yeah, because um, I, I agree with everyone, pretty much what everyone's saying. It's just that COVID really took a big hit. And I met someone who says, right now, my electricity is off. I don't have any water. And this really took a big hit. And a lot of people, this, you know, the stimulus check. So financially, moving is not an option for a lot of people at this particular time, especially with COVID. Uh, relocation finding a place um, financially, a lot of those people are uh, low income that I know. And, uh, you know, that, that that's probably going to be my, my, my issue because they come to me when I'm downtown. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And I send them to the set because, you know, but, you know, without all these new emergency stimulus money, trickling in from other stuff. I mean, we're getting one for infrastructure for people to help them, you know, improve their home maybe and things to that effect. Maybe these people could just say, okay, I'm ready to do this. But at this time and place, I haven't seen anything. I, 
uh, what's the old saying? They haven't released the good yet. I mean, we're still looking at our 3.3 million infrastructure one, trying to figure out where to allocate that and where it needs to be put. And there's a lot of different people wanting different places for it to go. So I think in a time like this, I personally myself would probably wait and not really vote until we have something structured for these people with the ones that are really hurt. Because the way she was saying, if I understood Kate correctly, there's a lot of people that are low this just don't have the means to, 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 to get by what they're basically getting on. Either they're not working or they're getting unemployment or not. And, and that's why I, I usually like doing science because you can see visually, it's like going into an encampment to see how these people are living versus a picture. So you maybe get a better idea of what, what, what it is we're doing and what we're voting on before we say, yeah, okay, this bill, but to see what these people are living, what their life is like. And I guess that's probably why I'm looking at it from that perspective, uh, if that were me, um, but I don't know, thoughts? Oh, I was gonna say something that isn't really a response to you, Gary, if that's all right. But maybe Dan, okay, Dan gave a thumbs up. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering from staff uh, if this idea could could be workable. Um, it's just something I'm exploring right now, but the if we if we don't want to affect you know the the low income uh, people there, at least you know the ones who are presently there and living there, can can the substantial improvement trigger be waived? No, it can't. So the substantial improvement trigger comes from the National Flood Insurance Program. So that's kind of the, you have to have the substantial, those definitions of substantial improvement and substantial damage are tied to that program. Mm -hmm. right. So there is no workaround. It's, it's either we do the two foot base flood elevation and, you know, for the, the deeper discount. Um, and then I, I would just add, I know that you're all aware of it, but um, you know the base flood elevations are old based on old mapping. So that kind of additional freeboard, the, the one foot above actually you know, does help address things like climate change and um, fluvial erosion hazard and um, development that maybe has developed in the floodplain that the original maps didn't account for. But that's just mm -hmm. an aside. Dan. Yeah, I uh, building on what Brian was saying about uh, essentially the the ones who are there are grandfathered in. Is that essentially right? Uh, so what we're talking about is I, I think uh, we need to what, what would be helpful actually Sue or Brian would be like a profile or two of the people who would be affected uh, as far as you know, is it someone who is trying to build a low low quality uh, pad versus a high quality pad, and you know what are the costs involved? That 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 would put something, uh, pardon the pun, but concrete to the to our thinking about this since it's concrete. Uh, uh, and you know, uh, this kind of profile, it would be like a what's the risk? that's really this person or these people, this maybe three different types of people are really exposed to, you know, there's the financial risk, of course, but if they, just as a pro, just as an example, I mean, if they have kids who are going to die in a flood, that's a, you know, that's something that you can't put, you know, you can't put a, qu a quantity on. So just to put that, you know, put something in perspective, maybe. I'm I don't know if Brian or so a it. couple of different profiles. I think what we could attempt to do is kind of look at some of the vacant pads and say, okay, here's the, you know, the four foot above elevation, the pad design that they have and what the cost of a new mobile home or Vermont or something like that might be on it. And then kind of look at what the base flood depth is there and then kind of you know, see if we can't, can't look at it like that. Yep, Gary. I, I could go with that to like a cost analysis to sit down with the, with the people who are affected or impacted by the COVID and where they're at financially, 
Um, because like I said, a lot of people were working at Vermont Bread. The unemployment's messed up right now, and there's a lot going on. So people financially, whether they could they could afford insurance. I mean, that'll probably be something I can digest. I can live with to sit down with a person and have an, an idea. I don't know if that would be the person who owns the park or the people who are, who are going to go in there. I guess we would propose or something like that. I mean, that way these people have an idea of what's going to be coming out of pocket and what's going to be the course of this. Well, see but I think that, gets back, that gets back to Brian's point, though, that, you know, the, it's not really about the the impact to individuals in the park now. That's not really mm -hmm. where the impact's at. It's more to the um, cooperative and people who want to move into the park. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much, um, you know, I don't have the skill to sit with people and determine their. <laughs> That's a CPA. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and it's also not everybody wants to disclose that either. So I'm not sure right. we could go that direction. I think we could look at construction costs of elevation. Um, and one big question for me, too, to, to kind of uh, um, flesh out the gray area is, is what defines a substantial improvement. You know, because if someone's living in a place their whole life, um, there's there's almost everyone makes, you know, to, to enjoy their house, they make inevitable changes and modifications and improvements. And so that would help, you know, direct me more towards a yes or a no, that kind of gray area. Yep, Dan. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add uh, that, you know, it, it might be good to relativize these expenses to other uh, precautions, safety precautions that might be taken. You know, the, what what are the alternatives if 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 this person uh, or profile of person, uh, you know, were going to build uh, in a similar flood zone? You know, uh, would what would the my my thought is that it would essentially be a lot cheaper to do what this alternative is than to do something like a full foundation with a basement in a flood zone. But that that's just a speculation. I don't know. But having an idea of what the you know what the choice is that this person's making would be useful. I I understand it would be a lot of speculation though. Yeah, I see Brian's hand up. So I think what I could do is I could make an outline of some of the permits we've issued for improvements to homes there. And it will give you a good sense of just what, what type of investments people are making in their homes and also the comparable values of their homes. Um, so you can see the percentage increase. And you know there is that incremental improvement and maintenance of their homes. So that is something that goes on. Um, and then there has been at least one park that put their homes on full foundations. And I think there were basically housing units over garages. So I could look and see if I could find the cost of those improvements. Thank you, Brian. Um, just about 8.30. Um, kind of feel like we're wrapping up. Um, I wonder if we have to make a motion to, uh, to do whatever we're gonna do with this flood. Uh, regulation amendment. Maybe we should, because this is kind of a official meeting. Someone want to venture venture the phrasing for what we're going to do with it? I guess it would be a motion to continue. How's that usually go, select board soon when they want to continue table for the next discussion, is it, or next well, meeting? Yeah, but we're not. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is going to take some time. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, it, Tom, are you looking for a motion that basically says you're not going to advance the flood hazard, the proposed flood hazard amendment at this time, and you're asking staff to do some additional work, research, more outreach, more. Uh, exploration of costs and alternatives. Yeah, I think that's what I'm hearing from the commission. More, would it be more public input from them too, from the park, if anyone wants to add in or chime in also, or? 
could that be added with that too? If anyone could give them time, if anyone else wants to, you know, say anything, Kay, we could send Kay, shoot her a kite and ask if anyone else wants to join in, if they have the capability to, you know, uh, I guess speaking to what- Yeah, would we, would we, the question might be, would we be rescheduling another public hearing for this? Is that the question? And can that yeah. be realistic? Can that realistically be scheduled within the month of June? No. Yeah. Okay. So no, I'd have to rewarn anything, and uh, honestly, don't have the staff time to do this. Could we? Could we delay um, the uh, the other land use regs um, delivery to the select board until say August, and then we would also have the flood um, our decision one way or the other on the flood uh, amendment by then? We so, could, it, so, it could, so it could potentially get to them as one whole package? We could. Okay. Well, can I just ask a question? I, I understand, I totally uh, appreciate that, you know, we may disagree on what the final vote will be regardless of what uh, extra work Sue and Brian <laughs> deliver to us. Uh, I mean, we could still take a vote on this now, and and if it it, it is what it is, uh, you know, it's not a matter of. Um, I mean, I I I appreciate getting more information too, but, um, you know, we could still take a vote on it. Mm. Just as a just a question, I, I don't want. I'm not asking for a motion on it, or you know, you go you think about it. But I, and I know we're getting late, but. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to follow, idea. I think, some rules that I think is <laughs> applicable <laughs> to Robert's rules or commissions, which is that the, the uh, you know, the chair isn't supposed to make a motion. Um, but I can, you know, I could prompt people. Um, but I think we know, yeah, there's two motions potential, right? Which is vote on what's been proposed, yes or no, or vote on delaying it. Um, or if we vote no for the first one, then we'll also do the second one. How do we do so that? I don't know. I think I think whoever says says a motion first, you know, might. Well, how would that you might, word that? That David? might be part of someone's strategy here. So whoever. How could but, you word that in the same token of continuation, of getting that information that we were going to get, uh, for those people that Brian was going to get. Because hmm. because he said he was going to get some more information, we're going to look over. So the motion to agree to say yes now would kind of default that. Right, we could make a motion to delay the decision, and then if that gets a no, then essentially we vote on it now. I can I just say I think I'd prefer the yes no vote, and then um, and then follow it up with if if it fails, hmm. follow it up with a motion to direct staff. I delaying makes me a little uncomfortable because of the way it was warned and stuff i feel right. like we would deserve another public hearing from it so so i'd rather just like end this and then direct staff one way or another how would we word that sue i i like i like that that was just a motion to just a motion to vote okay to vote on the current question and then continuation okay it could be based right off of that agenda proposed motion but you know modified a little bit like it was before. Okay. Anyone? I'll, I'll make a motion to, oh, sorry, Prince. It, you, I think you beat me to it, go ahead. No, go Dan, that's fine. I <laughs> just right. want to move things along. All right, I'll make a motion to vote on the, uh, on finalizing the uh, proposed amendments. Does that make I'm sense? Hazard to merit, proposed flood um, hazard amendment. Proposed flood hazard amendments. Yes, thank you. And forward to them to the select board. And forward them to the select board. Is there a second? Yep, Gary. Second. That okay. Was a public hearing on that during that time. So the motion is to pass the flood yes. use regs to the select board. Okay. Yep. Um, all in favor? Of of the motion <laughs> of, <the> motion. <laughs> of pat of 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 approving the two foot base flood thing and and everything okay. so i see gary and i see dan's hand okay and all those opposed the other three of us three to two 
Fair enough. I I'd, I'd, I'd prefer it to be, you know, kind of democratic. Yeah, voted on. Okay, great. So um, I don't think we have much discussion. Maybe we do, but I think another motion is in the works here. So I think the motion that you're looking for is something to direct staff to provide more information uh, on the effects of the flood hazard regulations, proposed flood hazard, hazard regulation amendments. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, sorry, go for it, Prudence. I don't have it. How to put it together. <laughs> you can always say so moved, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so moved. So moved. <laughs> and I second that. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor, I guess. All in favor? Okay, and all opposed? Okay. And that's all of us. Okay. We have our public comment, our, our other sort of public comment slot, no public. So there being no other business to attend to, but no, yep. hold on. What, what, Sorry. Yep. Sorry, Tom, but I just want to clarify. So we did approve all the other amendments and those are going right. to the select board. Right. Okay, yes. thanks. Sorry to belabor it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I move we adjourn. <laughs> that good. That one too. Great. And there's a second. We're, we're adjourned. There doesn't All need right. to be. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks for Thank a long well. meeting. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, guys.